baseline suite of impact decision support services that we all as central region WFOs can provide and move forward together on. So that's the process we're in, and it very much is a process. I certainly want to emphasize that. And part of this process is uh, noting that IDSS encompasses all that we do. Again, that there's nothing groundbreaking with that. We, we know that. Uh, it takes uh, a sound science and forecast. It takes healthy collaborative partnerships, understanding of user needs and impacts. Obviously, there's been recent talk through uh, OWA of, of building these deep relationships, which is necessary. There's the operational readiness, readiness that is uh, invaluable and necessary through strategies and tools to support a responsive staff. Uh, is an enhanced and effective services. Obviously, we need to convey uh, weather information to our core partners, and then the training element is obviously an important part of all of this to hold this up and move it forward. So as we talk about IDSS, it's not just about these tools or a toolkit. It's about all that it takes to create a DSS culture uh, within our office, within the region, and the weather service, and now we're all part of that moving forward together. So to meet this mission together, uh, we obviously are looking at how to uh, identify, develop, um, and roll out these common tools, common procedures, common services that we all can utilize and build from going forward. A common DSS toolbox supports obviously the staff and it provides a means for us to provide uh, common services uh, to our core partners. So that. These, this toolkit, it very much is a toolkit, is having the right tools, but also knowing when to pull those tools out at the right time. And we're obviously, as we go along here, we'll continue to refine that toolkit and how to use them based on your, your feedback. Now, along those lines, just some, some assumptions that we, I think, probably can agree with, and from a team perspective, we identify that WFOs have been and are providing DSS. Uh, and at different levels, different spectrums. Uh, each WFO has different, maybe a different niche or a different kind of uh, partner needs from a metro to mountainous to the plains to marine, uh, recreational uh, focus, whatever it may be, we all provide DSS maybe from different vantage points with a different emphasis. The toolbox of what we've rolled out is meant to encourage DSS, not confine it, but actually encourage it and promote more of it. Uh, these tools, uh, as you probably well know, are not perfect. That is realized. And this is version 1.0 of a common DSS toolkit. There will be changes and improvements. Uh, and there is much more to be done, and that will be done as we move collectively together as a region. Uh, this toolkit uh, that we've brought out so far does not and will not supersede any national initiatives or implementation that come down the pike. But what we hope will happen and is happening is we can provide a prototype and the tools and the know-how to get some of these things done as national implementation takes place over time. So what we're doing will play a critical role in how we're moving as an agency. All of this will take us working together uh, as WFOs in this region as well as we work with other regions and other projects uh, nationally going forward. Most offices now have the DSS toolkit implemented, which uh, includes a common way by which we provide one-to-one -one DSS, whether it's remote or on-site. Uh, obviously, it includes the DSS request form, the DSS calendar, logging capabilities, and the ability to plot an AWIPS, JAR analyst, and also a separate SA viewer. So this is the initial toolkit. It's important to note as we roll out these common tools, this is not just about having and developing just some tools. It is about developing a collective IDSS mindset and culture in each WFO. So as you implement these tools and use them, certainly be thinking, as you probably are, from an operational standpoint and how we can move forward as well. This is just a starting point as far as a toolkit goes. So why are we implementing these tools? Uh, basically to help our daily DSS operations. Also more formally organized, provide and document DSS for scheduled events, provide standard process and tools for service backup, which will be more critical as we go forward, tracking DSS requested by key partners for large and vulnerable events. So 
So having the ability to track those on a local but also regional level. And we create a record of those events um, that are useful. And of course, right now we're tracking scheduled DSS events. Uh, hopefully in time, we'll also begin to include those more, I guess you would say, uh, more spontaneous events that we also all perform on a daily basis. So the toolkit as a whole um, that, that we're integrating is a in, very much an integrated process. Uh, it's an automated approach to receiving those requests from our core partners, implementing those in an operational level, and sharing those across the weather service. It's these tools here which now you are running and testing and will continue to build on going forward. The ultimate purpose, obviously, though, is that the toolkit is not just about the tools, but it is about the service. We will, as WFOs, continue uh, with or begin providing, as some of you may be, one-to-one -one DSS, whether on-site or remote, for scheduled DSS events requested by the emergency management community. One-to-one -one DSS provides the opportunity for us as meteorologists to use our, ex our expertise in concert with the expertise of the EM community for public safety. Established DSS baseline cultivates a more, more IDSS opportunities, increased opportunities to interact with our partners and build those deep relationships with our partners and a baseline of services. So the tools mean nothing, obviously, in the end if it's not about building those core partnerships, connecting with our partners and serving them. And this is very much at the core of what this is about about providing one-to-one -one DSS to our core partners. So with that is a few things uh, we wanted to touch on as a team that, that have come out as we uh, the rollout has continued and we felt like we needed to clarify, if, if not even correct. Uh, one of those things is that uh, when the team had first begun, we were testing different ways by which to designate one-to-one -one DSS. And we had explored the option of maybe using a tiered system, using tiered one, tiered two, and so forth. Uh, we found that within the team that that actually just caused confusion and an undue complication to the process. Uh, unfortunately, some of the, that terminology is, got out there, I guess, and it was in some of our documentation. What we'd like to do basically is just avoid, to avoid confusion, we're just dropping the term tier one or tier two to designate one-to-one -one DSS. All the DSS we're talking about is that one-to-one -one direct support to the emergency management community. So to avoid confusion, we're no longer going to use the, any tiered system. There is no official designation for that. So I know there have been some questions about that. I think the simplest way for us that we decided was just to drop that nomenclature uh, going forward. Uh, the next thing that we found that needed to be clarified uh, in, in the form process and confirming our DSS request was we needed a common way by which we confirmed those requests. Because there were a number of ways that was being done that was causing some confusion. So when the DSS request comes in from the emergency management official, it obviously has that request at the very beginning of that event name. To confirm that request by your uh, local office management or other designee in the office, just simply remove that term request and do not add any other kind of terminology, including confirmed. Do not insert confirmed or anything else because that event name does go into AWIPS, goes into the calendar. Uh, eventually, if, as we expand possibly then into warnings as well. We need a nomenclature that fits that. So do not include confirmed and just simply remove the request. And at that point, that is designates to your staff that that request has been uh, confirmed and accepted there in the office. The other thing that uh, had, has come up was the use of more of an internal designation for situational awareness events. These would be events that we have not received uh, any official uh, request from emergency management, but there are situations we know that we need from a situational awareness standpoint monitor and be cognizant of during critical weather events. 
SA events are non-requested events. They're typically large or highly vulnerable, high-risk type of events. Uh, they're only meant to support the kind of event that where an imminent threat of severe weather uh, could be an impact and a threat to life and safety of those who participate at that event. It's only to be used as resources and time allow. An SA event is not an official request, so therefore there is no obligation by the staff to actually have to make these contacts. Uh, however, each office locally can look at how to include these SA events and how they like to proceed in making contact if the need arises. But again, this is meant to be more of a just keeping the staff aware of big events to where if there were a life-threatening uh, event or an event that could uh, impact the safety of participants, then you might want to take action. And the definition that we'll provide uh, to all offices uh, is this right here, a bit of a, a mouthful. I'll just kind of read through it. And again, this will be provided. A situational awareness designation for scheduled events may be used for critical or highly vulnerable events where emergency management is directly or indirectly involved, but there has been no formal request for DSS. SA events are typically large public gatherings which are not being formally supported by WFO staff, but may be notified if hazardous weather threatens. For SA events, the WFO staff has the option, but is under no obligation to notify the emergency management or designated public safety official. However, if staffing and workload permit calls to these SA events are encouraged, if hazardous weather threatens the safety of event participants. If DSS has been formally requested through the request form for a planned event, it is no longer considered SA. So before I move on to uh, a larger Q&A session, any specific questions as it relates to confirming a request as it comes in, and also the tiered system that we're no longer doing, and also as it relates to the SA definition and protocol? Okay, nothing has been received yet, so if you do have a question, again, just go ahead and type it in, or you can just raise your hand and I can call on you. So right now, Andy, we do not have anything from anybody at this time. All right, thank you. And oh. we're going to have an open Q&A session, so be thinking if something comes up, uh, and then we'll try to address those. And there may be some we can't address today, but we'll certainly get answers to them if we can't. Okay, Andy, actually, let, I, let me backtrack here. Corey King does have a question here. Um, Corey, I unmuted you. You want to go ahead and ask your question? Go ahead and ask your question. Sure. Hey, Andy, I know when uh, we installed the, the toolkit on the HTML graphic, it's still referred to the Tier 1 and Tier 2. Is that going to be removed at a future build or sometime soon? That is correct, Corey. We will remove that presentation on the viewer. Thank you. That's all I had. Welcome. Okay. Okay. Um, we have one from uh, Bruce Smith. Bruce, I unmuted you. Go ahead. Bruce, you there? Okay, well, let me see. I'll go ahead and answer. Um, Bruce asks, uh, will local WFO typically add the SA to the events? Correct. If the office, local management and, and official designees in the office declare an event to be an SA event, that is done within the office. And it is best to do that using the request form. So again, an SA event does not come from an official uh, requesting that event. It comes, it's, that's an internal designation. Okay. Um, Chance um, asks, uh, when a request comes in and uh, they remove the request part of the name of the event, can the office then shorten the name of the event or add extra information to that title? The event name should be probably as concise as possible and it should 
really focus on the event location and not the event name. Uh, that would uh, prevent us from getting any complicated factors with uh, the kind of event support we provide. So especially if they go eventually into warnings. So within the event name, try to have that name focus on the location of that event and probably as concise as possible. And then any additional information to describe the event goes within the DSS calendar details that will then populate uh, the, the, uh, the other DSS logging uh, functions. Okay. Um, got a question here from Andrew Just. Um, Andrew, I unmuted you. You want to go ahead and ask that question? Andy, you're unmuted. You can go ahead. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, I don't hear anything, so let me go ahead. Oh, are you there? <laughs> yeah, Andrew, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I. Uh, yeah, I was trying to get a mic here installed and mounted it. See, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, so I put on here in the chat, saying, you know, we have this communication system now in place, you know, for forecasters to get notified of DSS events, which is which is great. Um, is there is there any work being done on the communication side, saying back to the back to the partners? Think I'm kind of thinking along the lines of getting like some kind of regional templates for specific graphic like graphics that you would deliver to these different different partner groups, maybe a specific templates for EMs, for schools, um, think along those lines. And I've had some similar feedback to that. And just as a reminder, the requesting official, they automatically do get an email back to them that has a, a point forecast for that event location. But I think your idea of making that more robust with additional features is certainly something to be investigated. So I'd encourage you to provide those ideas and see what we can build on. Thank you. Certainly. Thanks. OK, I have another one here from uh, Phil Schumacher. Let me see if I can find you here, Phil. Um, you're unmuted. Why don't you go ahead and ask that question, Phil? Okay. I don't hear Phil, so let me go ahead and ask the question he wrote in here. He says, when entering the location, should it be the physical mailing address or the Google Map web address? Seems like there is duplication with asking for the address when the, with the t for the town. When the requesting official puts that in there, in there, hopefully they're putting down a, a specific address. This also is why we need each office to have a two to three member sort of QC team uh, to monitor those as those come through and ensure that those that location is correct. Typically, a, a correct formatted address will suffice, and then the lat line will be provided. But you can actually enter a lat line specific as well. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay. If it didn't, Phil, go ahead and type it in, and we'll get to you here um, second, in a second. Um, that's all I have right now, um, Andy, as far as uh, questions that's come in so far. Thank you. Great questions. And uh, be thinking of more. We're going to have continued time for Q&A. And certainly can follow up after the webinar as well as we go along here. And speaking of these very things and the importance of uh, you know, tracking the events as they come in, we're highly encouraging each office to have a small group, two or three individuals, uh, that can quality, quality control the uh, information as it comes through. We're finding most events come through just fine, but occasionally uh, the EM requesting the official may enter an address that's not correct may be incomplete, those kinds of things. So we need to make sure that latitude longitude fields are, are, are perfect, as noted, I think, by Phil uh, addressing that very thing. Um, and then QC other things, such as the title, event timing, and that will be based uh, in part by the confirmation of the event and, and further collaboration with that event organizer, uh, the, the EM uh, that you're coordinating with. But that will be an important process that you have some two or three members in your office that are kind of experts in monitoring this. 
And there also will be additional information regarding the process and a whole package of, of troubleshooting uh, items that Brian Rogerbook has put together, and that will be delivered to each office. And some may already have it that he's been coordinating with. So with that, we've already gone through some Q&A. Uh, we'll continue that. that there's an open session here. I first want to reiterate a few common questions we've had from the previous webinar and have followed up since, just to make sure we're on the same base there. In the interim, certainly think of other questions we can try to answer for you. Again, who do we support and, and who receives the request form? The DSS scheduled event request form is sent to our emergency management community. That includes emergency managers and other local, state, or federal government agencies that perform emergency management functions during events. Of what type of events are typically supported? Events requiring scheduled DSS typically include but are not limited to outdoor large venue events and or events with notified vulnerabilities to weather hazard risk. So again, it could be smaller, could be larger, but certainly if weather is a a factor in the public safety uh, and in the organization process for that emergency manager, then certainly that's a DSS event. Who authorizes or improves for scheduled event support within a local WFO? Local management and or designated staff will approve DSS provision through collaboration with the requesting party once the request is received. Once that's done, as we noted earlier, simply take that request off to confirm uh, for the staff that that DSS is now to be followed through with. How are the uh, specifics of one-to-one -one support determined? Local management or designated staff will collaborate with the requesting party on the specifics for providing scheduled DSS. So again, in the end, the support that can be provided based on resources, time, and so forth, you have the ability at the local management level there in, within your office to make those designations to what you can do based on collaboration with that requesting official. Is overtime approved to cover DSS event support? Yes, OT or comp time is approved to adequately staff and perform agreed to DSS for scheduled events. What about unscheduled uh, DSS episodes? This may be events and incidents that have not been you know, scheduled, these aren't planned events, but the kind of DSS we all provide, probably on a daily basis, between an emergency manager or a core partner. Unscheduled weather events or incidents is driven by driven DSS for core partners should continue, but is not going into the DSS calendar as a scheduled event. So in most cases, these may be one-time calls, one-time briefing. Those do not go into the existing uh, planned calendar. However, if something becomes a reoccurring or prolonged DSS request, maybe something following a, a significant event where DSS is required, that may go into then as a planned event to get that in the calendar and plotted for SA purposes within your office and, and better support. What should be logged in the DSS notes section? Again, within the DSS log, note your actions, your correspondence, collaboration with that point of contact that emergency manager that provides uh, not only a archive of what's been done that helps follow up staff of what they can follow up on and what maybe need needs to be changed information wise so that's important to the whole operational component of this who can see the DSS event database and calendar really everyone in region every WFO can see the DSS log the calendar and of course you see it plotted within AWIPS is the DSS log available on site in the event location? And this is a question we've had noted a few times. The existing DSS log uh, cannot be accessed out of office on site and event at this time. Uh, that was something we definitely want to work toward and, and get into play here. In the interim, what you can do if you're on site at any event out of the office, you can use the Google Calendar and go into the detailed section of the event to add actions there. Uh, that was an original thing we had tried out. It's a little clunky, uh, but it, right now it is a way by which you can provide that log information when you're on site at an event. Simply go into the DSS calendar. Because it's Google, it is available um, on site and out of the office. 
What actions should NWS staff take on every shift now that we have these tools in place? Simply review DSS events, calendar and log uh, as you come on shift. It sh should be part of our normal routine now, know what's going on, what to plan for, ensure the DSS events are accurately plotted with not only the calendar but plotted in AWIPS, obviously assign staff and actions as required to fulfill the DSS request and mission, and maintain awareness of ongoing events in primary and secondary backup offices. Uh, this will be a big plus for us going forward and knowing what's going on around us and how we may support those if the need arises. How about if we're already providing DSS? We've, we touched on this already. That's great. Again, we're emphasizing that we know DSS has been going on, is going on. This is all just a means for us to kind of get in the same boot, uh, boat and move down the same stream going forward as we continue to develop the Central Region Baseline DSS Toolkit. Uh, there's been some questions about how if we already have some DSS tracking tools. We're asking if the tools that you have uh, have the same functionality and the same purpose by which it's been rolled out. We're asking that you use the common tool set that's been rolled out. However, if there's maybe methods or there's uh, some additional functionality that has not yet been added to the existing toolkit, we want to work together to add that, to look at how we can move that together and add to and enhance this toolkit as a whole. So we want to, as much as possible, continue to build on a common tool set, common methodology as we go forward, knowing there's great ideas out there to bring into this as we move along. How about additional IDSS rollout? Um, as it pertains to more national oriented uh, uh, projects and implementation that will take place over time. Where does this fit in OWA? Uh, I'll have, if Kelsey, are you online right now? Yeah, I show him. Yeah, I show yes, he's online. He can address this, and until he gets on, I'll go ahead and address a couple of things too. Hey, Andy, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Kelsey. I want you to address the OWA and where all this fits going forward. Okay. Uh, thanks, Andy. I appreciate all the team's uh, effort and work on this uh, resource. And this tool definitely will aid the organization as we strive to provide uh, consistent levels of decision support uh, before and during events with the goal of building a weather-ready nation. Uh, this tool also uh, supports the IDSS uh, framework and the, the service to core and deep relationship uh, partners. During the uh, coming weeks, an IDSS uh, tabletop exercise will be conducted across uh, all WFOs, including RFCs, CWSUs, The Rocks, the NWS Ops Center, and uh, national centers. And this tabletop is going to be conducted by Central Region Headquarters uh, with the support uh, from the Operating Model Workstream and OWA. The exercise is really designed to clarify and strengthen DSS deep relationship partners, aid in the preliminary list of uh, core partners, uh, which uh, the this calendar will help support and also to help develop an open and trusting uh, organization, uh, provide DSS uh, training opportunity, encourage dialogue between offices as well as region on the variance and partners' needs, as well as to help uh, prioritize uh, the partners that we all serve. Now currently the team is also working to build an IDSS uh, core service level for the agency. Uh, that goal is really a set of tools, resources, and services that all offices will be able to provide to core and deep relationship partners identified uh, from this upcoming tabletop exercise. We're also uh, looking at the end-to-end -end partner experience from office to office and also looking at customer experiences in other organizations for best practices in this process. Uh, so as this IDSS framework uh, continues to develop and mature, uh, I'm working closely with Andy and Jim so that the tools that the Central Region team develops complements the IDS framework that you've all seen. And I want to thank both of them uh, for their leadership of this team. If you've got any questions, comments, ideas, or suggestions, always happy to hear those. Feel free to give me a call, send me an email uh, at kelsey.angle or provide uh, feedback uh, through the NWS Insider page. Uh, I can assure you that the work stream uh, looks at all the feedback that is received and that input is really going in to shape what's coming out uh, of the operating model work stream and OWA. All right, thank you, Kelsey. 
And to go along here, if you have questions that he can, Kelsey can address specifically, we'll certainly direct those to him. Again, as we noted earlier, um, the, the work that we're doing as a region will fall in line. It will even enhance and help to push these national uh, initiatives forward. OWA obviously is the overriding thing, and we hope that what we're doing basically helps d develop that, enhance that. Anything else, Kelsey, before we move on here from you? That's all on this end, Andy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also, there's been questions that concerns IRIS being a, a national program that's in development uh, with pieces rolling out. Uh, we will certainly, as we've done with OWA, be working with the IRIS developers, IRIS team to see how that development goes, where these pieces can fit. Uh, there's still questions there that's still not all clear how that will happen and even the full functionality of IRIS as it comes out. So the things we're doing, though, can very much prototype some of the functionality that can be added into IRIS. So what we're doing it is, is important and it will not, even though the, the tools may change with time, I don't know what that timeline may be, some of the functionality may change as far as specifics, the overall idea is going to move forward and very well be based on the kinds of things that we find and develop going along as a regional team and each WFO having a contribution there. So for questions certainly be answered on that, but our goal is to help uh, bring all these things together and to contribute to the overall initiatives at a national and regional level. And that goes along with our updates to the DSS tools planned. I think that's just inherent with the process based on your feedback, partner needs, ongoing changes in technology, that's just going to happen. So yes, this is very much a process and updates will uh, no doubt uh, take place. So with those kind of overall questions and answers, what other specific things can we try to address? I got a couple questions here, Andy. Um, one is from uh, Jim Pringle. Um, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Um, I'd like for you to go ahead and ask that question. So, Jim, you're you're unmuted. So, go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. So, I'll go ahead and read it. Let's see. It says uh, Grand Junction WFO is bounded by Southern Region and Western Region WFOs for 50% of their CWA boundary. Salt Lake, Salt Lake City WFO is their primary backup WFO. How is the backup situation going to work when dealing with WFOs outside the region? More specifically, how can Salt Lake City see our events in their AWIPS 2? I know this has been addressed by another officer too on the eastern borders of the region. We do know that the other, the other regional offices are able to get into our DSS login calendar, so that certainly can be shared. I'm not sure if anyone's tested yet the AWIPS capability, and maybe if someone from Jackson, Kentucky, or others who have tested this can maybe chime in on that. Um, and those, basically, there's some questions there yet to be answered into how to bring up these backup offices that are from our surrounding region. But it's something that needs to be addressed. So it's a very valid question. All right, thanks. I um, have a question here from Chris Miller, and I'll go ahead and read that for him. He um, says, uh, we have developed our levels of DSS based on the tiers approach. Tier 1 has highest level of service, Tier 3 the lowest. We are naming events with tier in the name so staff can easily identify level of service. Since the tier system is going away, how would you suggest we categorize levels of DSS in a way that is easy for the staff to recognize? And we may be talking about two slightly different things. I'm not sure, and it may require some discussion after the call. When it comes to just the events, the, the support to a, a emergency management official, that's a one-to-one, -one, uh, we're talking about just one, to keep it simple, this, that's a direct support to that core partner or core partner agencies. 
if you're talking about, so maybe from an operational setting or standing within the operations, that might be slightly different based on maybe the either number of DSS events, uh, perhaps the amount of other weather hazard uh, events that may be going on uh, that may require different levels or tiers of service. I know for in, within the uh, DSS team, we've been experimenting with the DSS matrix, which very much looks at the pinpointing and designating DSS levels for operational purposes, basically operational DSS levels, which does uh, help to guide the operation staff to whether they need to provide, say, a one-to-many service and what that service should be, whether it's just a routine public service day with no enhanced uh, products or services, and those events that require more intense one-to-one, -one, plus one-to-many type services. So without getting too, maybe too bogged down the weeds here, I think there's a place, yes, definitely, and we've discussed this as a team for operational DSS levels that guide the staff, but it may go beyond just the designating the support for a given uh, event request. So is that enough to cover right now? We can certainly discuss later. We can or we can do some more follow-up. Chris, I went ahead and unmuted you. So if you have a microphone, um, you're live. If not, uh, send uh, Dandy and myself a message, and we can get back with you later. Okay, I don't hear anything. So um, just go ahead and contact us, Chris, offline, and we'll we'll get that information out and send it to all. Um, where it's pertinent. Um, Jennifer Stark has a question. Jen, I see you're on the telephone. I unmuted you. You want to go ahead and ask the question? Question? Yeah, actually, this is Paul DeSue. We had a question about routine IDSS. Is there going to be some place where thought about where we could record that? You know, for example, a perfect example would be search and rescue for a lost hiker. Um, we do a lot of those in the summer. Is there some place we could just or thought about some place where we could just record those to make it available in a database for us to look at, you know, not only the contact, but also what we told them. We do that right now in some kind of ship blog, but maybe a regional or national database would be useful. That's, that's a great point, and we had discussed that to an extent. We first started, obviously, as we noted, with just scheduled events, uh, but there is a place, obviously, for these events that pop up in a more episodic type fashion, which may be for the search and rescue. It may be a response after, right after an event. It may be the briefings prior to a significant event. If I would say at this point, if you feel that it is going to require ongoing support for an extended time, and, and you have designated points of contact, you can put that certainly within uh, the planned event calendar uh, and DSS log. But at this point yet, we haven't really addressed uh, capturing every, say, quote-unquote, routine DSS or this more uh, spontaneous or episodic type DSS uh, that we all do. And that will be addressed, though. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. All right. Thanks. Um, let's see. Um, Ryan Knutsveg, you've got a question. I, I unmuted you on the phone. Go ahead. Yeah, Jim. Um, I had a question about the uh, SA calendars. We have uh, we created one over the last week or so. Um, that's just FGFDSS SA, so it's separate from the events calendar. And just curious if you see any benefit of keeping them separate like that. Um, you know, it'd be nice to have them color coded differently in the Google Calendar. But then, um, under the current uh, setup, it wouldn't be visible in AWIPS. So, um, any comments on that? That's, that very issue and question has been brought up within the team as well, that we need to designate uh, and differentiate between the SA events and then the formal request of events. So that's definitely noted. Uh, I would suggest still put it within the existing planning calendar as it stands now, just as, so we can see this and develop it. But if uh, certainly if you have ideas and things that work for you all in differentiating those, we're open to those suggestions. Thanks. All right, that's the only um, questions I received so far, Andy. Oh wait, I think I got one more here. Let's see. 
Uh, Bruce Smith here. Um, still a little confused about the SA events that the WFOs enter. Are these events the EMs that didn't feel needed support, or did the EMs simply forget to formally enter them? Right. These are events uh, primarily would be uh, identified from within the office that they have not received any formal request for, but we know by the nature of the location, the type of an event, it may be, uh, say, a, a, a public venue where you have an outdoor concert, maybe it's, say, a, a major league ballpark, whatever it may be, that there's been no formal request, but it, we know that from a public safety standpoint, when if there is a situation where you have a hazardous weather threatening the lives uh, and the safety of those individuals participating, we want to have a, have a heads up as an office that we may need to take action on. Is that, that's what we're talking about. If, however, those kinds of locations or events are noted beforehand, it's probably worth going to the emergency management community and seeing if you can get a formal request to come in, and that's certainly cleaner, and that gives more specifics to the actual support that's required uh, by the emergency management officials. So if you can do that before an event, I would certainly encourage that. Okay. Okay, nothing new lately, so we can probably move on. Okay, great questions. Um, Sometimes hard on this end of the phone to know exactly if they're being addressed the, the way they're being asked. So please follow up uh, with more following the call. We'll try to clarify those. Some of these things are we, we know they're out there that need to be addressed, and this is very much a process. We want to document those and work through them, and also look for common themes and common issues that we'll see multiple offices uh, questioning, trying to address, and we can try to help prioritize prioritize the development and rollout of additional enhancements as we go along. Hey Andy, before you go, I um, did get another question here from Melissa Smith. Um, she asked, uh, how are the EMs given access to the form? Currently, uh, each office has basically an internal link, HTML link, your office uh, website plus event support. And obviously, it will have it will be linked directly to that standard Google form that each office is using. You provide that EM, the EM community, with that link to provide their request. So basically, uh, each office will have to advertise and provide that link to their EM partners. Okay, Melissa, I unmuted you. Is that did that answer your question? Actually, this is Kelly Whitaker, the ITO in okay. Rapid City. Um, I understand that that, that uh, outside facing link is there with a the Google form, but they need actual access to the Google form. So is it possible just to give them access with their email address? Uh, so you're not speaking, you're actually talking about the log then, or? No, the request form. Right, and I just to make sure we're talking the same thing. They do have access to the actual form. They have okay. to go in and, and, and fill that out. Okay, because I looked at the, so does the, all of the public have access to that? Technically, I guess it's possible uh, at this point because it is an HTML link, but no, it's not made public. And that's okay. probably something else we'll have to address. There are the complications, access codes and so forth. Right now, that uh, that link is only to provided to the emergency management community. Okay. I hope that helped. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, that's all. Yeah, and, and just to follow up to that, that's another reason to QA these events. There has an occasion or two, just basically because the emergency management officials may even share this link with others who are not within the emergency management community, uh, and those requests may not be valid. So that, that certainly can happen either because if some, by random chance the public gets a hold of it or it's just shared in a way that maybe wasn't appropriate. So again, 
it's important to QA those events, where it came from, and what the request is for. All right, if no other questions, uh, and please don't hesitate to ask more, and so we follow up after the call with them. Our team will certainly do our best to answer those. As you can imagine, um, as we talk about DSS tools and the process, uh, that we, we sometimes get lost just in the mechanics of it, but at the core of DSS, as we know, it's about people, it's about those who we serve, all of the the means to the end here is to get to a point where we are all engaged with our partners, supporting them to the fullest with the tools that are the most effective. That's, that's what we're getting to uh, as a region, as an agency. And just to share a couple of quips here and stories that we've received just from our team, I, I assume and probably had no doubt you've received the same kind of feedback uh, from the event support you have provided within your WFO. But we're finding no matter if it's a clear sky or if there's hazardous weather that's approaching, the support is very much appreciated, enthusiastically so, in fact, uh, by our core partners. Uh, having that direct link and knowing they have that direct support uh, has been a, a huge uh, support to them. They've, what we've heard certainly within our offices, as I'm sure yours, uh, they very much like what they're seeing and want more of it. Um, so just a couple things here. Uh, the big event, and I'll just bring up, and I'll follow up with this. This is a story shared from Wes Browning, the St. Louis office, just from a recent event uh, that really highlights why it's important to have that core partnership in place before an event ever happens having a specific thresholds and issues that that core partner has that relates to that specific event or venue, how to follow up with that, and having that direct connection prior to, during, and after an event. Um, what we're finding, as I'm sure you have as well, is that with each event, whether it's a clear sky and maybe there's not any intense support need, or whether there was basically a life-saving support provided, it only enhances the support going forward to the next event. We're basically providing, we're creating and developing, strengthening these partnerships with every time that we provide support to our core partners, which builds on to the next one. So. Um, one thing we're going to do is encourage you all from each of your WFOs to provide success stories. And we're going to put on our Google site, just have a place to include whether it's quotes and quips from your core partners. Maybe it's a review of, of an event and, and how it went. And even a slides or YouTube. You want to put a YouTube briefing together just to go through an event. Uh, and give an explanation, an overview of what happened and how the partners benefited. We definitely want to get those stories in from the field and share those uh, with the entire region. Uh, I want to also ask here if there's anyone else on the Central Region DSS team that wants to speak to the success of what we've done to this point and any other thing you want to add uh, to some of your experiences. If you do, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, I don't see any anybody at this time. Okay. All right. So we've covered sort of where we are, and uh, and hopefully provided some additional clarification uh, and filled some holes going along to what we are currently doing with the toolkit that's uh, been implemented and going out. And we'll go official June 6th. Here are some other items I want to just bring to your attention. We, we, we briefly touched on this or on the first webinar on other items that the team has, has been exploring and working on. It really includes these other four items. One is the DSS matrix, and that does speak to a question we had earlier to DSS levels, operational levels, and how to do that. Uh, the situation report, the email protocol for email blasting, uh, two core partners, and then a common webinar protocol. And again, this is about creating a common, not only toolkit and operations, but common services that can be expected by a core partner no matter where they are within the region. 
We have an experimented matrix, and you can go uh, on the uh, project uh, site and go to the matrix tab if you want to see uh, what that looks like and how that's being utilized to this point. Uh, we have found it very useful in assisting uh, our operations, and it, it incorporates both the confidence or probabil probability of a given event as well as potential impacts to help decide how the operations should move, provide an operational tempo uh, for the staff, and then basically guides the staff to a standard set of tools and services that should follow if you're within a given level. So we have seen this to improve consistency, not just between offices, but within each WFO from a shift-to-shift -shift basis. So that's something we'll be exploring more this summer and looking to how that might be implemented or at least further tested uh, on a more regional basis going forward. So that's something we'll be concentrating on uh, this summer. So then goes along with that is the uh, dissemination of a situation report this is something that's in a PDF format that is also linked on our web pages. If you go to one of the demonstration offices, you can easily link to it. There's a bottom right corner. Uh, there's a place for that. It basically acts as a tap on the shoulder. We issue daily. However, when the DFS level reaches a certain level, uh, we then will then email blast our core partners with this. Uh, situation report, which provides valued added information as it pertains to weather hazards and risks that may not be found anywhere else. So it's meant to really add to uh, existing services as far as information and detail for the emergency management community, although it is uh, also accessed by the public. Again, something else we'll be looking at this summer and uh, getting more feedback on. So now what? Where, where, where do we go from here and, and where, we, where we hope to get to uh, as a, a project and um, certainly as a region? Uh, the, the regional IDSS prototype project is just the start. We realize that. You probably know that. Um, it's the start of building, testing, and demonstrating effective DSS WFO. And we're all doing that now collectively. The intent also is to identify common WFO needs, best practices, and solutions. This will be vital. So your continued feedback, suggestions, concerns, questions as we go forward will be absolutely crucial. As we get those, obviously we'll have to prioritize. Uh, it may mean we'll have to further develop the project, and there's questions yet to be answered to how all that may look going forward, but please provide your feedback. Uh, as you can imagine, we've gotten quite a bit to this point, uh, sort of a tsunami of emails. Uh, we want to be able to try to pick out themes, common practices, and areas we can begin to focus on as we move forward together on this. June 6th, that is when uh, we want this to be fully officially operational at each WFO as it pertains to the DFS toolkit that was just rolled out. Many of you are already jumping in, and that's great. Please do so and just get the process started. But certainly from an official uh, perspective, that will happen June 6th. Uh, we will have a follow-up call with each individual office. You'll hear from a couple of team members that will contact uh, your local office to just have basically a Q&A session, uh, a way for us to directly hear your questions, suggestions, and concerns and try to provide answers in that manner as well. So looking forward to that the next uh, few weeks. Continue with your feedback through those calls, through emails to any of us on the team. And also there's a feedback form on the Google site itself that will be collecting those as well. I know there's a lot of good ideas already on there. Our, our first uh, purpose here, or, or focus, has been to just really get the rollout out and have it get it going and then we'll begin to prioritize and address these additional suggestions and enhancements as we go along. Again, share your success stories. I think those are great to share what each office is doing. It builds momentum. We want to hear what everyone, else, everyone is doing, the great work that's going on. And then we, we as a team will be working hard on looking at these additional items as we just mentioned and the potential rollout of a, a second phase of tools 
uh, in some form or another come uh, later this summer or the fall. So we'll be hearing more about that. So that's what's coming. A lot going on, obviously. A lot of moving parts. And uh, we appreciate your patience as we move along in this process, as we try to answer questions. Uh, we understand there's a lot of great ideas. There's some maybe even some concerns. So again, thank you for your patience. I want to, uh, before getting off here, provide uh, Jim Lee, our regional chair uh, for the employer organization, to have a chance to speak here. Jim, if you're on, I want to give you the opportunity to speak here. Yeah, Jim, I unmuted you, so you should go. All righty, can you hear me all right? Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. I want um, to uh, assure everyone that at the Regional Labor Council level, uh, there's definitely broad support for DSS initiatives across Central Region. Um, I think everyone understands that this is a direction where the agency is really trying to expand its influence, which is a good thing. Um, the DSS team has done a lot of great work. Um, I think we can all see that a lot of thought has gone into this, and they've tried to plan ahead. And I think that this is the right step to take. Just to piggyback on what Andy and some others have said, I think the point was well made that this isn't about the tools, it's about the service. You know, these tools are here to help us all and not to get in the way. And everyone understands that they're not perfect, so that's why they really are relying on your feedback from the field. Uh, to improve this so that we can provide effective and consistent DSS. And I can assure everyone that the feedback and the questions that are received by, by me or by the DSS team, that those are addressed and incorporated into making those improvements. So it does make a difference. Um, and if we can provide good DSS, that's what it's all about. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim. And, and again, thank you the support from regional headquarters and your management. Uh, from the employer organization at all levels is much appreciated, and certainly from you at the office and at WFO level, absolutely necessary. Your support going forward is how we'll move forward with this. So thank you for your time, Jim. Uh, Keeney, I will hand this over to you if there's no other questions. All right. Thanks, Andy. And and um, just want to reiterate um, the, the hard work that the team has uh, put in over the last year, year and a half. Um, that they've been together, the test teams, uh, specifically Andy Foster and Brian Brajenbrook, they've they've taken the lion's share of, of a lot of this over the last several months, and I really appreciate that from a regional headquarters uh, perspective. And, and all the, the test team members, I really appreciate the work for that. And then also all the offices that have really stepped up and, and really spun this up uh, fairly quickly over the last month or so. So really appreciate that. Um, also, just to keep in mind that we will, like Andy had said, we'll be working together as a team on the, on the next phase. Uh, we do hope to get together uh, on a face-to-face -face meeting to really look at what we've done so far, what we expect to do here um, this summer and into the fall. And also really working with uh, the headquarters and the IRIS team and really trying to get in lockstep with the overall national project. So um, like Andy said, this is version 1.0 here in Central Region, but our goal is not to um, have a national project that's totally different than what we've, we've um, rolled out here uh, this month. So that will be our goal at the region and as far as the team. So I do not see any other questions. So with that, uh, we'll close today. Again, if you do have any questions, comments, uh, contact me or Andy Foster. Uh, definitely use that feedback form on the Google site. And um, again, go up and do that DSS. Like I said, many have already done that, but come June 6th, Hopefully, we'll all be having input into that uh, DSS calendar. So again, thank you, and I'll talk to you all, all later. Thanks.